Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Today we celebrate Reformation. One year ago, if you'll please recall, we had a rather large and involved celebration of the Reformation. The reason for that is the 500th anniversary of Pastor Martin Luther's posting of the theses on the door of the church. And 500 years later, still thinking about these things, still working through these things, we have this great and grand celebration. I remember that day uh, very uh, intensely, vividly. Really the, the two weeks leading up to Reformation. I can recall this is when we received these particular pyramids that they came to our church and we began to use them here. I can recall uh, Dr. Allman's installation as our associate pastor, director of parish music. And I can remember sitting with Pastor Murray is and listening to the sermon. I remember the title, Why I Am a Lutheran. It's on the online world, it's on YouTube. And you know, that particular day, though, was just the end of our celebration, which really had lasted for about a year. For that time before, those 365 days, we had any number of things coming out from Concordia Publishing House and other places. There were, there were Bible studies specific to understanding the Reformation. There were books, there were uh, t-shirts, there were cups, there were pencils. There were all sorts of things available to help us, to help us understand, to help us see the importance of what took place 500 years ago. But I remember after that, and then I've heard comments after the first service, is that after that was done, after that long year, after that day, many people said, wow, that was a great celebration. I'm glad that we're now done with that. And the meaning there was not the Reformation itself, but simply all of the busyness and all of the struggle and all of the difficulties that went on during that year. And you can understand that. Because we were there. And it often is the case when you have these kinds of celebrations, you have these kinds of great run-ups to a great thing, that afterward you just want to relax, you want to put up your feet, and you say, that's enough Reformation for me. At least that's the view passage. But let me say this. When it comes to the Reformation, great and glorious as that celebration was, we cannot give up on it. Because the center of the Reformation, the core of the Reformation, is not about the cups and the pencils and the this and the that, but it is the teaching that we observe there. It's seeing what God worked out at that time, in that place, for those people, before our eyes, in a sense. So that we can learn certain important things. We can learn basic fundamental truths about God, about ourselves, and how that works out. Typically, when we say Reformation, what is the doctrine that we're concerned with? Everybody says the gospel. And that's true. There was a kind of a pronunciation, a proclamation of the gospel that came back to its original clarity. It's about Christ. It's about the forgiveness of sins. That's definitely true. The law, of course, was also included with that. Catechism teaches us, the scriptures teach us, that before you can rightly understand the gospel, you've got to understand the law. And so that was another subject, another teaching that came forward from the uh, the dialogue and the interactions of the Reformation, definitely so. How do we know or how do we come to learn these basic truths about the law and the gospel? Well, there the answer is what? Is it our hearts? Is it in our minds? Definitely not. In fact, one of the side teachings we can say of the Reformation is to fundamentally distrust our heart and our mind when it comes to Christian doctrine. We've seen it time and time again that when people distance themselves from the Word of God and only think of the brain and only think of the heart, that we're liable to make errors. 
And so then here is the point. That the sole source and the sole norm of all Christian doctrine and practice is the Holy Scripture itself. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Greek Scriptures. These are the words of God. This is the word of God. And it teaches us the truth about all of these things. Well, at the heart of the Reformation, working out these concepts, of course, is the Scripture. I just said it. But now the question, which Scripture? Which part of the Bible? Which is the best one that we can go to here that teaches what we're talking about and talking about the Reformation? Well, there's lots of possibilities. In fact, you might have your own, and they're all good. Don't get me wrong. But the one that comes up frequently at the time of the Reformation, the one that comes up frequently even to this day, is our epistle reading. Romans chapter 3. Because there you have a discussion of the law. There you have this discussion of the gospel. There you have this discussion of the nature of the word of God. All these things you had mentioned. And most importantly, this. The teaching is absolutely clear. It's rolled out in such a way that if you follow it, point by point by point by point, you can see the teaching clearly. You can hear the teaching clearly. You can understand and give thanks for the blessings that come to us by way of this teaching. And so it's Romans chapter 3. So let me start with this. In Romans chapter 3, the part that we pick up, St. Paul says this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. That's the reading. This beginning of this particular part of uh, St. Paul's letter to the Romans has its purpose, has its goal, establishing what we call jurisdiction. At least that's what the legal people call it, jurisdiction. And what that means is, is who has control over you, who has something to say about who you are and what you do. And so we think if we live in the United States and the federal government has jurisdiction over us. I mean, the place where we clearly see that is with federal living taxes, right? People who say to the IRS, I don't pay income taxes because you have no jurisdiction over me, end up, end up where? I think in prison. Because if you live in this country and you're an American citizen, what you get to do is you get to pay taxes to the government, and that's the way it works. If you're in the state of Texas, there's a Texas jurisdiction. If you're in the county of Harris or Fort Bend, there's a county jurisdiction. If you live in the city of Houston, there's a Houston jurisdiction. And then there's one jurisdiction, even smaller than that. It is the jurisdiction of the home. Because they're the one who rules the two. The parents. I'm a parent, like you said. And who are the ones then who are the governor? Well, of course, it's the kids. There's the husband and the wife, there's the wife and the husband. Depending on that conversation, right? <laughs> you see, in each one of these places, in each one of these jurisdictions, there is a kind of a control, there is a kind of an oversight. What Paul wants to tell us is this, that when it comes to the law, what is the jurisdiction of the law? All people. Not just Americans, not just Texans, not just people in the county of Paris. All people from the time of Adam and Eve until the last person conceived and born are all born under the law. God created Adam and Eve, God gave them the moral character, God gave them the image of God, and so it goes from Adam and Eve all the way until the end. The law is the one that governs that group, those people, with no exceptions. That is where the law speaks, that is jurisdiction. He then follows up with this, that by way of the law, the means of the law, no person will be justified in God's sight. Well, how does he get there? Because here all we've talked about is whether the law applies to us or not, and the answer is yes, it applies. But typically when we think of laws and we think of jurisdiction, we think of things that we can actually do. We can pay our taxes, we can obey the speed limit, we can go and do this and we can go and do that. How does it get to be the point where there's no justification, no salvation before God by way of the law? The answer is the fall. 
And that's the assumed piece here. That is the plain teaching of the scriptures that when it comes to all who are under the law, we are all fallen people. We are all fallen creatures. Now here we had a baptism this morning. It seems like he's left the boat. Yes. You know, it's, it's hard to say, and the parents know, that this little, beautiful creature is in fact a sinner. And people might say to me, Pastor, you are a brute and you are a heel. How can you talk about such a beautiful little baby girl in that way? That she's a sinner under God's wrath. It makes no sense. So how can we say that? Because it happens to be the truth. It happens to be the teaching of God. It happens to be the teaching of the Holy Scriptures themselves. It's not so much that Julia Francis has done any one thing different from anybody else. And that's the point. She's just like the rest of us. Born into sin, born after Adam and Eve, born after the fall, born after all of that kind of blackness that follows the fall. Sin now given to each and every one of us as we're born into this world. Original sin. Actual sin that we add to it because as it turns out we're sinners and so what do we do? We sin. And then the knowledge of what sin leads to, then the knowledge of the consequences of sin. Where are those consequences? No slap on the wrist in this court, friend. The consequences for sin in the courtroom of God are death for all people. Physical death, spiritual death. And that's serious. There really is no more serious fact to be comprehended, no more serious fact to be understood in the place of sinners, before the wrath of God, being sinners. And that's where Paul places us. Well, that is a black place. That is a hole so deep, we're not digging out. That is a debt so large, there's no, no means of paying it off. That's our situation under the law. That's our situation under sin. Now what do we do? We listen to the scriptures. Because it's right there at that point, under that judgment, that Paul then blurts out, but, but, let me read it. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. If you've heard what I've said, and if you understand our situation under sin, and the consequences of sin, this particular interjection by Paul, this but from Paul, should absolutely catch your attention. You should be listening. Because what he's saying is, is that while it's true on the one hand, according to the law, we're under judgment. That is true. Now, there is a form of righteousness, the righteousness of God, which is available to us that does not come by way of the law. The law and the prophets testify to it, that is, the scriptures testify to it, but it's not by way of works. It's another way. What is that way? Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ, not just as a person who exists, but faith in Christ who takes on the law and takes on our place, actively keeping the law, dying in our place as substitute for the penalty that we owe, for the punishment that is due to us. And so Paul's holding these two things together here. On the one hand, you have the law, you have the consequences of the law. On the other hand, you have the forgiveness of sins, and you now have the righteousness of God, which is available by faith. These are the two things. And then he puts them together so we understand it. He says, first, with regard to the law, all who have sinned, all of us, we all fall short of the glory of God. That is our status under the law. But because of Jesus Christ, because the Father has offered up the Son as propitiation, as atonement for our sin, because, again, again, Jesus has actively kept the law on our behalf, actively, passively, I should say, received the penalty due to sinners. Because he has done that, there is now a justification. There is now a forgiveness. There is now a reconciliation to God that is available by faith. Not by works, because works are ruled out. 
sometimes people will say, not any of our Bible study classes, people will say, oh, so what you're saying is, is that faith is another work. We have the Ten Commandments, God is taking those away, and now we have to do faith, and then we're saved. It's still salvation by works. That's not what's being said. The law, the law of God always stands. It can never be dismissed, it can never be taken away, because it is the reflection of his very nature, his very person. And so when God tells us that faith now is the way we can be uh, receive the righteousness of God, when God now tells us that faith in Christ specifically is the way we come to have the fulfillment of the law, what he means is, because Jesus has done it. There's no cheating here, there's no deception here. The law stands, the law has a claim on us. Jesus comes, and Jesus fulfills the claim on our behalf. And this then is how faith works. This is how faith then receives that which Christ has won for us. He's done it. We can't do it. He grants it to us by faith and not by any work whatsoever. Well, this is the core teaching then of the Reformation. And this definitely is the thing that has caused all of the problems in the past. What is the law? What is the gospel? Is that really right? Is that really wrong? But this last bit from St. Paul, I think, really brings it all together, really does explain to us in the fullest possible way the meaning of it. Because it's not the nuts and bolts. It's not here's the law and Jesus keeps the law for you. But it's rather the reason that he keeps the law. It's rather the reason why God has done the things that he has done in the person of Christ. And so he says this. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so here's the idea. And it's a wonderful way of putting this all together, making this plain and clear in our minds. God wants it both ways. God has to have it both ways. On the one hand, because of the law, he is just. <coughs> when Jesus suffers, when Jesus dies, justice is served. It's not something outside of God, it's God's very nature. At the same time, he sends to us Jesus Christ, he's providing through the sacrifice of Christ, providing through this act of obedience of Christ, the forgiveness of our sins. And there we learn something that we could have never learned by way of the law. And that is... That God is not just just, not just legal, not just keeping things straight. But He is merciful. He is loving. He desires to bring to us and to give to us the forgiveness of sins. Not only does He desire it, He accomplishes it through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. And you see, that's what's so important and so wonderful about this last particular part. It's not the nuts and bolts. It's not the explanation of the system. But the reason, the meaning for what's taking place. And the meaning is clear. That while God is in fact just, He is the one who justifies us. He is the one who has reconciled us. He is the one who comes to Julia Francis and brings to her the forgiveness of sins through the waters of holy baptism. Not because of Mary, not because of anything she's done. Clearly and purely out of His love for her and for us. And so this then is what, in the end, is what Reformation is all about. This is what that great celebration is all about. This is what that whole year is really all about. So that at this point, in our own time of thinking about the scriptures, and our own time, meaning 21st century, we look to the scriptures, see that law, and see that plan, and look to the cross, and look to the empty tomb, and see what Christ has done. And there see and discover and receive that blessed life, that blessed forgiveness, that blessed love that our Lord has provided for us. And for this we offer our thanks. In the name of the Father.